All right, this is the Hidden from Jehovah's Witness series video number five. I'm going to be answering a couple of comments that were sent to me and uh, addressing an, an issue. There will be a number six if all goes well. There's another one that I'm working on after this one. But for this one here, I just want to cover a couple of things really quickly. First of all, some people had written to me telling me that Jehovah's Witnesses do not sell their literature. They say that they freely give it away. Uh, I want to say, first of all, that the way I got their Bible version, they sold it to me. That's how I know they sell their literature. They sold it to me. And these other Watchtower books that I've acquired over the years, nobody gave them to me. I had to buy them. So uh, they do indeed sell their literature. Either the leadership is selling it to their own members or their members are selling it to outsiders. But we have to remember the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society is a book publishing company. To my knowledge, that's the only product that they make. So they must be making money off the products that they're making. Um, so I'll just address that. They do sell their literature because they sold me their books. They sold me their Bible. Um, the next thing I want to deal with very quickly is... I mentioned in one of the uh, views video number four about the Watchtower Society's involvement with the United Nations. While they tell their members they have absolutely nothing to do with government, the reality is they have plenty to do with government as uh, well as being a part of the United Nations. This here, I'm going to put it up on your screen, is from 2015. Yep, this year that I'm making this video, 2015. Uh, as I mentioned in video number four, the Watchtower Society goes under a whole bunch of different names. Uh, they go under the Jehovah's Witnesses, they go under JW.org, they go under the Christian Congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses, they go by the name of the International Bible Students, and they go by the name of the European Association of Jehovah's Christian Witnesses, just to name a few. There's quite a few names that they go under. So overseas, they go under, one of the names they go under is the European Association of Jehovah's Christian Witnesses. This is dated February 18th, 2015. It is another letter written to the United Nations by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. It'll be on your screen. It says, from the European Association of Jehovah's Christian Witnesses, complimentary submission to the UN Human Rights Committee, subsequent to the adoption of the list of issues, seventh report, of the of the Russian Federation 113th session of the Human Rights Committee 16 March to 2 April 2015 and the signatories on here is Lusa uh, Toffoli Council for Religious Freedom and Marcel Gillett chairman of the Religious Freedom Subcommittee and then it has the Watchtower addresses here one in Belgium it has the phone numbers here the email address to the Watchtower Society and then it says contact in New York Philip, Br Philip Brumley General Counsel for Jehovah's Witnesses, and they have the phone number here, 845-306-0711. The Watchtower Society, very much still involved in the United Nations, even though they continue to claim they have nothing to do with government. And again, you may wonder why it is that an organization that claims to be the truth continues to mislead their own people. And we're going to take you right back to their publication, Insight on the Scriptures, Volume 2, under the section L. It's written like a dictionary. Under the section L, you'll find the word lie. We'll put it up there on the screen for you. It says, lie, the opposite of truth. Lying generally involves saying something false to a person who is entitled to know the truth and doing so with the intent to deceive or to injure them or other persons. When you go over to the next page, second paragraph, it says, while malicious lying is definitely condemned in the Bible, this does not mean that a person is under obligation to divulge truthful information to people who are not entitled to it. So to the Jehovah's Witness leaders, they believe it's completely fine to lie to anybody who they consider as not entitled to know the truth. And what the members of the Jehovah's Witnesses don't realize is that to the leadership at the top, their members are not entitled to know the truth. The leaders at the top wants to be the elite and they want you to be the sub, you know, the, the guys that are underneath. 
They don't want you to have the knowledge that they have. They don't want you to have the information that they have. So they want to keep themselves way up top. They want to keep you way down at the bottom. And that's one of the reasons I decided to put together this Hidden from Jehovah's Witness series because I believe that people who went and joined groups like the Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, Roman Catholicism, and others, I don't know if anybody that went and joined these groups that said, hey, I want to go join a cult. I want to go join a group that's going to make me an enemy of God. I don't know anybody that's done that. People who go and join these groups, they join these groups because they want to become Christians. And they didn't realize that the group that they were joining, while they claim to be Christians, the group claims to be Christian, what they are teaching inside the group is not Christianity. True Christianity believes that you can pick up a King James Bible and you can read it and come to an understanding about what it's saying. It's not hard to read, never has been. You can understand who Jesus is. You can understand heaven and hell. You can understand all the doctrines of Christianity simply by picking up a Bible and reading it. But the Jehovah's Witness leaders have a different view on the Bible. This is what they said. Some of you have heard me quote this before. I'm not going to stop quoting it until every Jehovah's Witness that's out there hears this and understands this is their leader's view of the Bible. It never changed. This is their view. Watchtower, August 15th, 1981. They writes this. From time to time, there have arisen from amongst the ranks of Jehovah's people, those who, like the original Satan, have adopted an independent fault-finding attitude. They say that it is sufficient to read the Bible exclusively, either alone or in small groups at home. But strangely, through such Bible reading, they have reverted back to the apostate doctrines that commentaries by Christendom's clergy were teaching a hundred years ago. To the Jehovah's Witness leaders, reading the Bible is a bad thing. Why? Because if you read the Bible, you're going to realize that the stuff that they're giving you is not Bible. So they want to keep you away from the Bible and they want to put you into the magazines and focus your attention on the magazines and the other books that they write. That way you never come to the knowledge of what the Bible actually teaches. I'm going to help you break through this wall. For those of you who have written to me telling me that you watched the video series and with the help maybe of the series or maybe with the help of others, you've decided you were leaving the group and coming free of the Watchtower, I salute you. I'm praying for you. And this video series, this one and the next one that I'm working on is the next step. What I'm wanting for you to do is this. Now that you're out, when you were in there, they gave you a lot of information that just simply wasn't true. And this information needs to be cleared up. You need to get the right doctrines and the right teachings. As I said in the earlier videos, one of the first things you need to do is to take that New World Translation and toss it in the garbage. Because in the next video, we're going to be dealing with this thing here, the New World Translation, and showing you how they changed it from the real deal to what they wanted it to be putting their own words, own expressions, their own philosophies into it, where they lead you to think that their Bible version is the real Bible, when in actuality, the good old fashioned 1611 King James Bible is the word of God in the English language. And we're gonna get into some of that in the next video. But for right now, what we're gonna be dealing with, one of the teachings that they taught you is that Jesus didn't die on a cross. They taught you that he died on a stake now their teachings keep changing. Here's one of their books here. It's called The Harp of God. The Harp of God was put together many years ago by the Watchtower Society. This here is dated 1921. Yes, 1921. This is The Harp of God. It's a Watchtower Bible and Tract Society publication. We'll put it up on the screen so you can see. It says Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, International Bible Students Association, Brooklyn, New York, USA. And it's right here, written by Joseph Franklin Rutherford, second president of the Watchtower Society. In this book, The Harp of God, Jesus Christ is portrayed on a cross. We'll put it on the video so you can see it. He is portrayed on a cross. In this book, The Harp of God, Jesus is portrayed as hanging on the cross. A few pages later, they have something written here at the bottom. It's going to be on the screen too. And it says, 
When the grand finale is sung and all the harpers of heaven and earth unite in beautiful harmony, blending with the voices of all the creatures perfected and happy, the great ransom sacrifice will be recognized by all as one of the strings of the harp of God that will yield sweet music to every year. Then all can truly sing, in the cross of Christ I glory, towering over the wrecks of time, all the light of sacred story gathered round its head sublime. Watchtower Society teaching and praising the cross in the book, The Harp of God. So they used to teach the cross. Today, they don't teach the cross anymore. We have an issue, I do, because this is an organization that claims that they have the truth and nobody else had the truth but them according to them. And uh, they used to teach the cross, and they said the cross was the truth, and now they say the cross is not the truth. In their earlier publications, like their first Bible version, this one here, the 1950 edition, leading all the way up to their 2013 edition, they taught that Jesus Christ was impaled on a torture stake. Well, they've changed that doctrine too. In the new 2013 Jehovah Witness Bible, he's no longer impaled on a torture stake anymore. He's now nailed to a torture stake. So we're dealing with an organization that keeps changing their teachings while claiming each time that what they're teaching is the truth. Well, the truth does not have an expiration date, but clearly the Watchtower truth, quote unquote truth, has an expiration date because today they'll tell you something's true and then they'll come back years later and say we have new truth and teach you something completely different. Well, we're going to get on to how did Jesus die? And folks, I'm letting you know, I saw some, a, a video on YouTube. I grew up listening to a lot of music. I like classical music. I like dubstep. I love uh, EDM and all that. But long before that came along, there was the 80s and the music of the 80s. And some of the groups I listened to in the 80s loved the music, still love the music. One of the people I listened to in the 80s, the music, was Prince. And I saw a video on YouTube where Prince comes out on the stage and in the background on the big screen was the word Straros. And Prince goes on to say this. Staros, by definition, a wooden stake driven in the ground used to cause torture or death. Staros, perhaps someone lied about the way that someone died. Now, I learned over time that Prince was heavily influenced by a member of his band. And this member of his band, a Jehovah's Witness, helped to lure Prince into the Watchtower, and he became a Jehovah's Witness. The way the Jehovah's Witnesses lure you in is they take someone that doesn't know the Bible, and they're easily able to sway a person that doesn't know the Bible, because if you don't know the Bible in the first place, if you don't know this King James in the first place, you can easily be tricked by something like the New World Translation. So they told Prince, the word straros means stake, right? Well, I decided to do some research to find out what did straros mean and what did xylon mean because those are two words that they're quick to throw in the faces of their members to say there was no cross, it was a stake, a torture stake, they say, and they say, look, it was a stake and the proof is in the Greek. No, the word straros, they say it means stake. They say xylon means stake. Like, okay, let me look into it and see what it really means. I went to a whole bunch of different places looking this word up. One of the places I went to was a section of um, Wikipedia. Now Wikipedia is not always a reliable source, but this particular page was a debate, sort of like a debate written, where it appeared to be a Jehovah's Witness and a Christian sort of debating how did Jesus die. Now remember in an earlier video I told you, whenever you see a Jehovah's Witness literature and it claims to quote somebody, 
and it will say blah 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 dot 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 blah 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 I said whenever you see that dot 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 red lights sirens buzzers everything should be going off in your head because I've learned that that dot 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 is put there by the leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses in order to cover up something they don't want you to see so when I looked at this page we'll put it up there on the screen for you they have the definition of straros on there and I want you to notice that it says straros an upright stake dot 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 you see that straros an upright stake dot 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 I said wait a minute I want to go and look up the book they claim to be quoting and see what the dot 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 is hiding it says here they're quoting the theological dictionary of the New Testament volume 7 the theological dictionary of the New Testament volume 7 so I said okay I'm gonna go look it up and see what it says okay here's the page right here this is what it actually says are you ready it says put it on the screen straros an upright stake such as is used in fences or palisades number two straros is an instrument of torture for serious offenses it may be a vertical pointed stake an upright stake with a cross beam above it or a post with an intersecting beam of equal length that's a cross folks definition number two the straros is a tor is an instrument of torture for serious offenses it may be a vertical pointed stake an upright beam with a cross beam above it or a post with an intersecting beam of equal length that's a cross let's continue to read here the penalty of crucifixion. The Persians seem to have invented this form of execution. Alexander the Great and his successors used it, then the Romans, although not officially for citizens. Josephus mentioned mass crucifixions of rebels in Judea. The condemned person carries the cross beam to the place of execution, is fastened to it with ropes or nails, and then is hoisted on the stake which is already erected. About the middle of the post, a wooden block supports the suspended body. The height of the cross varies. A tablet hung around the victim states the cause of execution, and this is then affixed to the cross. Scourging often precedes crucifixion, and the victim is exposed to mockery. What did the Bible say happened to Jesus? He was made to carry his cross. When they got to the place where they were to crucify him, they nailed him to it. So he was made to carry the cross. Then they had someone else carry it for him for a while. When he got to the place where he was to be crucified, they nailed him to that cross and raised him up. There's your straros. Upright beam, cross beam. You're made to carry the cross beam to the place you're going to be crucified. Why didn't they tell you that the word straros means cross? Why did they just show you part of the first definition, but not give you the whole definition? This is the book they claim to be quoting from. Let's continue to read. Why not? Let's continue to read and see what it says here. B, straros in the NT, straros in the New Testament. You ready? Remember, the watchtower said straros only means stake. According to this, straros means cross too. But the watchtower didn't want you to know that. They kept that hidden from you. Look at what it says here. Straros in the New Testament. The cross of Jesus. This is the same book they claim teaches that straros only means stake. You're seeing now, definition number one, straros is an upright stake such as used in fences or palisades. Jesus was not building a fence or a palisade. 
he was being crucified for the sins of the world. So definition number one would not fit. But you notice in the wiki, the Watchtower only put in the first part of the definition, straw roast is an upright steak, dot, 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 dot. That is deceptive in the highest order by leaving out what straw roast really means. It says it so clearly that Straros, an instrument of torture for serious offenses, may be a vertical pointed, by the way, very important. Listen to this about the vertical. Remember they, they, they claimed Jesus was hanging on a vertical beam, a vertical stake? A Straros vertical stake has a point. It comes to a point. All the pictures that the Watchtower Society shows of the Jehovah's Witness Jesus being impaled on a torture stake or nailed to a torture stake, he is not on a pointed stake. He's usually depicted on a piece of wood that's either round or square with a flat top. If it is a straw roll stake, it would come to a point. The Watchtower Jesus is not crucified on that. Their definition is wrong. Their picture is wrong. And we're going to get on that in a moment as well. But you see here clearly, it says straros. It may be a vertical pointed stake, but that's not how he died. An upright with a cross beam above it, or with a post and intersecting beam of equal length, a cross. They didn't tell their members that straros also means a cross. And by doing so, their members were misled, sent door to door, telling people that Jesus hung in the wrong way. Prince goes out on his stage, I'm sure innocent, he didn't know. And he presented their viewpoint. And maybe somebody will be able to get back to him and say, hey, Prince, you need to check this out because you need to look into this because it looks like the Watchtower didn't tell you the truth about how Jesus died. Here's another word that the Watchtower uses concerning the death of Jesus Christ. They say, well, the word Zylon. They say Zylon means, uh, you know, wood or, or timber. Well, let's see what Zylon means. Zylon means living or dead wood, anything made of wood, e.g. a stick, cudgel, or club, also a bench or table, as an instrument of punishment and restraint, uh, and it's kind of a wooden collar. Is that how Jesus died? A wooden collar? No. Let's keep looking at the other definitions, like definition number four for Zylon. Put it on the screen. Definition number four for Zylon. The cross. A distinctive use of Zylon in the New Testament is for the cross. The basis is Deuteronomy 21-22, which stresses the shame of being exposed on a tree. Acts 5-30, Acts 10-39, etc. makes the point that the crucifixion is the greatest possible insult to Jesus, but that God had displayed his majesty by raising him from the dead. Paul in Galatians 3.13 shows us that Christ has redeemed us from the curse by being made a curse for us according to Deuteronomy 21.22. The curse lies on those who break the law, but Christ, who has not broken the law, voluntarily and vicariously becomes accursed, and his death on the accursed wood makes plain. He thus released us from the curse and from the death that it entails, 1 Peter 2.24. Is to the same effect when it says Christ bore our sins in his own body on the tree, with a plain reference to Isaiah 53, 4 and 12. The vicarious element is prominent here. Human sins are laid on Christ, crucified in him, and thus set aside. Christ does not lay sins on a scapegoat, but takes them on himself and cancels them on the cross. so that sinners dead to sin may live to righteousness. Zylon, definition number four, the cross, and points you directly to the New Testament where the term is used, referring to the New Testament, then shooting you back to the Old Testament to show you how they both intertwine together. Zylon is cross, just like Straros, is cross.
but the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society didn't tell you. They led you to believe that Zylon and Straros was not a cross. Straros, Koine Greek. In Koine Greek, the form of Greek used between 300 BC and AD 300, the word stratos was used to denote a structure on which a Roman executes criminals. In the writings of Diodorus Siculus, first century BC, Plutarch and Lucian, non-Christian writers, of whom only Lucian makes clear the shape of the device, the word stratos is generally translated as cross. This form of capital punishment involved binding the victim with outstretched arms to a crossbeam or nailing him firmly to it through his wrists. The crossbeam was then raised up against the shaft and made fast to it about three meters from the ground. The feet were tightly bound or nailed to an upright shaft. Stravos means cross. When you read the Bible story of what happened to Jesus, he was paraded down the street carrying his cross. When he couldn't carry it any further, they had somebody carry it for him, and when they got to the place of crucifixion, they nailed him to it and raised him up onto the cross beam, hands already outstretched, nailed to the cross he was carrying. Why didn't they tell you that? You see, Jesus did that for you. He didn't sin. We're the ones who sinned. It was our cross he was carrying. It was your cross he was carrying. Not a stake. Cross. They lied to you. I'm going to show you something else where they lied to you. About the cross and the stake. This is the Jehovah's Witnesses Kingdom Interlinear Version. When you go to the back, this is the purple edition for those of you who want to look this up at your kingdom halls. When you go to the back of your Kingdom Interlinear version, they talk about the stake. And they take a picture. This is page 1156. They claim that this picture, we'll put it up on the screen for you, of a man hanging with both hands over top of his head. They said they got this picture from a book called De Cruz Liber Primus by Justice Lipsius. What they did is this. The pictures you're seeing on your screen are taken from the same book, De Cruz Liber Primus. I want you to notice the pictures of people hanging on various kinds of crosses. The Watchtower leadership ignored all those pictures to focus on the one picture of the man hanging with both hands over top of his head. And what they did is they took that picture, they brought it over into their book, and the Watchtower leaders put their own words to that picture to give you the impression that this is what Justice Lipsius believed, that Jesus died on an upright beam, a stake. But that's not what Justice Lipsius wrote, and that's not what he said. When Jesus is often depicted crucified, what do you notice usually in the pictures? Number one, you notice it's a cross. Number two, the letters I-N-R-I are usually over top of his head. Thirdly, oftentimes there is a glow or a halo around the head to signify that they're talking about Jesus. So why then did the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society ignore this picture from De Cruz Liber Primus. Put it on the screen. Why did they ignore this picture? For those of you who are listening to the audio version of this, the picture depicts the picture we normally see of Jesus on the cross. Hanging on a cross, the letters I-N-R-I above his head, the glow around the head, at the base of the cross is a skull. Why a skull? Because the King James Bible says the place where Jesus was crucified was called Golgotha, and it gives you the definition of Golgotha, 
the place of the skull. So he puts the skull at the base of the cross, and in the background, you see the city of Jerusalem. Why would the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society tell their members that Jesus Christ was impaled on a torture stake or nailed to a torture stake and try to say that Justice Lipsius in his book agrees with them when he had this picture in his book of how Jesus died on a cross? He goes on to say in his book, in the Lord's cross, there were four pieces of wood, the upright beam, the cross beam, a piece of tree trunk below, and the inscription above. Why didn't they mention that to their members and lead their members to falsely believe that Jesus died on a stake? In their book, Reasoning from the Scriptures, I believe it's page 89, put it on the screen. They're talking about the cross. They claim to be quoting from the Imperial Bible Dictionary. Remember I told you about the dot, 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 dot? You're about to see it come into play. But they're going to be exposed this time. It says here, the Greek word rendered cross in many modern Bible versions, torture stake in the NW, is straros. In classical Greek, this word meant merely an upright stake or pale. You just saw that that definition they gave is a lie. Later, it also became used as an execution stake having a cross piece. The Imperial Bible Dictionary acknowledges saying the Greek word for cross, streros, properly signifies a stake or upright pole or piece of paling on which anything might be hung or which might be used for impaling, fencing in a piece of ground, dot, 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 dot. Among the, amongst the Romans, the crux from which our cross is derived appeared to have been originally an upright pole. Is that really what the Imperial Bible Dictionary said? That it wasn't a cross, but it was an upright pole? This is the photocopy from the Imperial Bible Dictionary. Put it on the screen. The part in the yellow is what they have in your reasoning from the scripture book. The part in the purple is what they ignored using dot, 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 dot. So let's take a look at what they ignored with the dot, 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 and we'll read it exactly as it is here. Matter of fact, let me just start right from the top and read it all the way through without stopping. That way you get it in its full context. I'm not trying to hide nothing. It's the Watchtower trying to hide stuff. I'm going to bring it out right here, put it up on the screen, let them read along with me. Cross crucify. The Greek word for cross, stroros, primarily signified a stake or upright pole or piece of paling on which anything might be hung or which might be used for impaling a piece of ground. But a modification was introduced as a dominion and usage of Rome extended themselves through the Greek-speaking countries. Even amongst the Romans, the crux from which our cross is derived appear to have been originally an upright pole, and this always remained a more prominent part. But from the time that it began to be used as an instrument of punishment, a traverse piece of wood was commonly added, not, however, always even then. A traverse piece of wood was added when the Romans started using it for punishment. This second section down here says, others extending their arms out in a pandabellum. There can also be no doubt, however, that the latter sort was the more common and that about the period of the gospel age crucifixion was usually accomplished by suspending a criminal on a cross piece of wood. 
The Imperial Bible Dictionary says, Criminals during that time was crucified on a cross that had a traverse beam. Cross beam. This is what I mean when I say, when the Watchtower Society claims to quote somebody and they put dot, 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 you know they're hiding something. So for all the definitions, for straros, they say it's just a stake. When you read the full definition, it says it's a cross. When you see Xylon, they say it's just a timber or a tree. When you read the full definition, they say when it's talking about the Bible, the New Testament, it's a cross. But they didn't tell you that. They didn't tell you that. They claim to quote from Justice Lipsius's book. They take a picture out of his book. They put their own words to it. And they leave you to think that this is what Justice Lipsius believes when it's not what he believes at all. And they ignore the picture of the man on the cross that's in Justice Lipsius's book. They ignore the picture, the uh, inscription above his head, the skull at the base of the cross, and Jerusalem in the background. And they ignore the fact that Justice Lipsius said, in the Lord's cross there were four pieces of wood, the upright beam, the cross beam, a piece of tree trunk below, and the inscription above. So they misled you. They lied to you. They lied to you about how Jesus died. They sent you door to door to tell others the lie. I don't think that you intentionally mean to lie to anybody. I think you joined the group because you thought you were joining the truth. But I think you're learning through this video series that they're not telling you the truth. There's only one place on this earth you're going to find the truth. Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is called in the book of John and in the book of Revelation, he is called the Word of God. Guess what the Word of God is? It's the Bible. But not just any Bible. My King James Bible tells me that God said that the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. God said his words are pure words and that he would preserve those words. Here's the preserved words in our language. In the second chapter of Acts, the Holy Spirit of God showed that he was more than able to take God's holy word and translate it into at least 13 languages just like that. It was accurately translated to the point where the people on the street hearing these men come out of this upper room, they came down and began preaching to these people in their own native language. Five minutes earlier, they couldn't speak those languages, but the Holy Spirit empowered those men that they were able to go down and speak to those people in those people's own languages. And in the second chapter of Acts, it gives you a list of all these different nations and languages, and they were able to speak those languages just like that, with the power of God's Holy Spirit. If he can translate his word from the original language to their languages accurately, he was able to translate it from the original languages to English. And he did. And he did it in a time before the politically correct movement, before the feminist movement, before the sodomy movement, before all of these strange movements that are moving through the world these days. In 1611, they didn't have all that stuff going on. He gave us a pure, holy Bible. A pure, holy Bible. And he wants us to read it. And he wants us to believe it. You can trace this Bible back to the Tyndale Bible, the Coverdale Bible, the Bishop's Bible, right on back to the original manuscripts. But I just wanted to touch base with you on that and let you know they didn't tell you the truth when they said Jesus Christ was impaled on a torture stake or nailed to a torture stake and they denied the cross, I wanted you to show, you know, show you the facts of how Jesus actually died. It's really simple, guys. The Romans killed him. 
To this day, the Romans still show you how they killed the Son of God, and you never ever see a Roman Catholic walking around with a man with both hands over top of his head because they know that's not how they killed him. They know he was crucified on the cross because they're the ones that crucified him on the cross. Okay. Straros means cross, as you saw. Xylon means cross, like you saw. Justice Lipsius did not say Jesus was impaled on a torture stake, as the Watchtower says. You saw it right from his own publications where he portrayed Jesus on a cross. So I just wanted to bring that information to you, and I'm going to close it off, this video segment, by letting you know the hope that I have. You, as a Jehovah's Witness, if you'll be honest with yourself, you're in a religion that gives you no hope. They tell you that if you work hard enough for the organization, and if you're obedient enough, that maybe, maybe you might be found good enough to make it to paradise earth. Maybe. They say you're certainly not going to make it to heaven. They say that's only 444,000. But they say you got to be like really faithful and be going to all the meetings and all this stuff if you're going to make it. And maybe you'll make it. And I have talked with Jehovah's Witness elders who had been in the organization. One told me over 50 years. And I asked them, I can ask them, if you were to die right now after over 50 years in this organization, doing everything they told you to do, if you were to die today, do you make it or do you not make it? And the answer is always the same. They always say, I don't know. I don't know. Well, I want to let you know something. The God of your New World Translation will leave you wondering, are you ever good enough? You'll never be good enough for the God of this book because he's not the real God. The God of my book, the King James Bible, lets you know, number one, you don't have to earn his favor. He's a loving father. You don't have to earn your father's favor. I stand on this verse till the day I die. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. The Watchtower Society tell you you're supposed to believe on the name of Jehovah. It's not what the Bible tells you. The Bible tells you to believe on the name of Jesus Christ. Let's see what it says here. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. I believe on the name of the Son of God. I believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. I couldn't earn it. There's nothing I can do to improve on what he did on that cross. It was not a stake. It was a cross. And he bore that for me. He died for the sins that I've done. He died for the sins that you did. Whether you accept him or you don't accept him. He died on that cross for you and he did it for me. All he asks us to do is to accept what he did. If you don't accept it, when you die, you will face him. And he will have no choice but to sentence you to hell. I know you don't believe in hell. The Bible says that God would that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. He doesn't take pleasure in throwing people into hell. So he took the time to come to this earth, live out a human life for 33 years, to show us how to live, to show us his ways, and then to allow himself to be put to death in a human body in the most humiliating of ways, paraded down the street, beaten up, whipped, crown of thorns on his head, spat upon, cursed at, and then stripped naked and hung on a cross. Remember, they took lots for his clothes, hung naked on the cross. God, the creator of the universe, hanging naked on a cross outside Jerusalem, dying for the sins of a world that cursed him and hated him and would not acknowledge that he was God. But he did it because he loves you. I want to give you the hope that I have. I didn't have to earn my way to his favor. I just simply said, I believe. I believe Jesus died on the cross for me. And I asked Jesus Christ to forgive me of my sins. And he did. And because he freed me from the curse of sin, I still sin, I'm a sinner. 
but I'm clean. He purified me. He'll do the same for you. I can't earn my way to heaven because I can't be good. None of us can be good. It's not in us to be good. Not by his qualifications of being good. Just read the Ten Commandments and see how many of them you broke. It's not in us to be good. He did the work for us. He cleans us up through Jesus Christ. And he just asks us to believe on him. Didn't ask you to work for it. Didn't ask you to earn it. He asked you to believe. So if you're a Jehovah Witness and you just watched this video and you've seen where the Watchtower Society has misled you about the cross of Christ, they lied to you about his cross, they lied to you about their association with the government and the UN, you need to come out of there. You need to come out of there. I know they make it really hard for you to come out. If you have a family, you need to have your family sit back and watch the Hidden from Jehovah's Witness video series. Watch it. Just, just watch it. Just watch it. With them. That way you can all come out together. Be freed from that organization that continues to mislead you. And get your entire family the authorized King James Bible. Start in the New Testament and start reading. Learn who Jesus really is. Learn what he did for you. Learn how to live a proper Christian life, not the kind of life that they taught you to live. This is the book that will clean you up. They tell you if you read the Bible, you're like the original apostate Satan. I can imagine Satan doing a lot of things. I can't imagine him reading the Bible. But they say if you read the Bible on your own, you're like the devil. I think only the devil would say something like that because he wants to keep you away from God's word. Pick it up, read it, and everywhere in this King James Bible where it contradicts what they've told you, let God be true and let every man be a liar. Let God be true and every man be a liar.